Anybody um, happy to be here this morning? Anybody glad to be here? Hey, say amen. 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 It's great to see you. I'm so glad that you're here. We've been talking about uh, love this month, and last week we talked about loving our neighbor, and we saw that our neighbor is really anyone that we share community with, right? So our neighbors are anyone that we have interaction with as we live our lives, anyone we have interaction with as we go about our day-to-day, and Jesus... Let us know that our neighbor, our neighbors are not just people who are like us, right? They're not uh, specific people or even people groups that we have necessarily chosen to love. They're not people that we've we've specifically chosen to love. Your, Your neighbor, our neighbor, may be people who are of a different social class than we are. Our neighbor might be of someone who is of a different race than we are. Our neighbor might even be someone who comes from a different religious background than we come from. And so no matter what the differences are that are there between us, Jesus tells us that we need to be the people who are merciful. Right? Right? We need to be the people who are merciful to each other. How does, he, how does he end that? He says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And then the expert of the law gave the right answer, right? The one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So what Jesus teaches us is that no matter what the need is. We, we need to be the people who are willing to help. We need to be the people who are willing to heal. We, the people of God, are those who should be willing to reach out And to lift people up so that they can stand on their feet. And so being a neighbor to someone is being merciful to that person. Being a neighbor to someone is showing up and helping in their time of need. Today, we're going to take that concept, man, and we're going to take it even farther than that. Because it's like, the love of God is supposed to exist within our lives, right? And the love of God kind of is supposed to be radiating outward from us. And yes, the first people who should get that exposure are, are the people who are closest to us, right? The first people the, that that love should touch are the people who are closest to us, the people that we already love, the people we're choosing to love. And we talked about that. But then it's supposed to go out from us and it's supposed to go to those we have interactions with no matter the differences. And then today, we see that love going even farther than that where Jesus commands us not just to love our neighbor. Jesus commands us to love those who are against us. What do you think about that one? Love those who are against you. Love those who hate you. We are to love those who we consider our enemies. Now, we asked a question last week, right? Because it went right along with the text. The, the, The question from last week is, who is your neighbor? Well, the question for this morning is, who is your enemy? Now we know that ultimately, like, you know, the devil's our enemy, right? Our, 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 our struggle is not against flesh and blood, right? But against rulers and powers and authorities in the heavenly places. We know that. This morning we're talking about people, right? Who is your enemy? And I don't want you to do it out loud. I don't want you to say it out loud. But in your head, I want you to do that, right? In your head, I want you to name them. Don't say it. 
But I want you to think about that. Who's your enemy? Who are those people you could put on that list of enemies? And I want you to name them in your head, right? I want you to name them. You know, I kind of grew up in the, came of age kind of in the 80s, right? And uh, I was really excited when they came out with another Top Gun movie. Anybody love that, that movie, by the way? So really excited when they, and they're going to release a third one, I heard, all right? So really excited when that movie came out. And um, man, Top Gun Maverick was an awesome movie. It kind of revisited a lot of those things we loved about the first movie. But uh, I, when, it, when it first came out, I started reading some stuff where people were being critical, right, of the movie because in that movie, they don't really name the enemy. Remember that? They don't really name who the enemy is. They don't really name who the bad guy is in the, mo- in the movie. It's just some nameless rogue state. And, and I heard people being critical of that and say, well, that's just kind of the temperature of Hollywood, right? You don't want to isolate a, the foreign moviegoers, so you don't want to you know, name the enemy. Or, or some said, well, that's political correctness that's worked its way into one of our most loved movies of all time. And then you start looking at it, and in reality, you know what? They were intentionally vague about the enemy. But so was the original Top Gun. And right now, fans of the movie are going, some of you are going, no, Jim, the enemy in the original movie was Russia, Right? I read this article back in, uh, it, was, it was published in 2022, and it was titled, Who is the Enemy in Top Gun Maverick? And it begins by saying, the fact is, ambiguity about the enemy, like shirtless beach sports, high-speed motorcycles, and aviator glasses, have been baked into the Top Gun franchise from the beginning. Those of us who are around and when we saw it originally, right, it, when, when was it? It was 1986. We were in the Cold War. The Soviet Union was our enemy, right? They were the bad guys in a lot of movies that we went to. But if you go back and you rewatch it, they're never directly mentioned as the enemy. The Russian MiG 28s, that's not a real plane. <laughs> It's actually an F-5, an American-made F-5. It's painted with markings on the tail, and the the marking on the tail was a red star inside of a yellow circle, and they just came up with that icon to be reminiscent of someone who may be an enemy (laughs) of the United States. We all assumed something about the enemy, didn't we? We all assumed that. We assumed the enemy was Russia, but they were never named as the enemy. I want you to name your enemy in your head right now. Who's the person? Who's the people that you see as being against you? Who is opposed to you? And it doesn't matter, no matter the topic, no matter the situation, I want you to put a name and maybe even put a face to someone you think is your enemy. Maybe you need to close your eyes. Maybe you need to visualize that person, right? You have them, close your eyes and and see your enemy. And then I want you to listen. Once you have your enemy in your head, I want you to listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, 43 through 48. You have heard it it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wow, how do you feel about that one? He not only says, love your enemies, he also says, pray for those who are persecuting you. Pray for those who are persecuting you. Those people that you thought you think are your enemy, Jesus says, love those people. 
And remember the kind of love we're talking about, right? Remember how we've defined love? The kind of love we're talking about is a love that takes action to benefit that other person. I'm supposed to do that to my enemy? I'm supposed to do that to someone who's against me? I'm being asked to do things that benefit someone who is opposing me? And he says to pray for those people. And he's not talking about, say, a prayer for bad things to happen to that person. Right? That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about saying a prayer that that person gets what's coming to them. Because those are the kind of prayers we want to pray, right? He's talking about asking God to intervene in their lives. He's talking about asking God to be present, asking God to be there and to help resolve whatever it is that's coming between the two of you. Love your enemy means changing your heart to see that person in another way. Because I know you don't want to hear this, but maybe, just maybe, in that situation, maybe, just maybe, you are the jerk. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe in the situation, maybe you're the jerk. Because we read this, and how do we always read it? We always read this from the perspective that we're the person that's been wronged, right? We always question how, how can I love someone who has mistreated me, right? We always go to, well, the relationship is broken because that other person is so bad. Woe is me, right? Well, maybe that's not the case all the time. And I know you don't want to hear it. We never want to consider that a person is our enemy because we were a jerk. Or maybe loving your enemy means stop being a jerk and start behaving in a way that's beneficial toward that other person. Maybe praying for those who are persecuting you is asking God to change the hearts of people who are jerks to you. Help them stop doing the things that are coming between us. Jesus says we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And then he says, why do that? Why do that? So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, you, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What's the standard for the Christian? Nikita Khrushchev, who was the first secretary of the Soviet Union from 1953 to 1964, once said this. He said, you know, there are those people who are trying to equate Christianity with communism. And he said, those people are mistaken. And here's why. When a Christian is wronged, they love and forgive. When a communist is wronged, they knock the person's head off. And Jesus says there's a reason. There's a reason we love and pray for those who oppose us. It's because we want to be like our Heavenly Father. That's why we're that way. And what does He do? He blesses everyone, doesn't He? He blesses and He benefits everyone. 
And you know what? We all get to choose what kind of people we're going to be. And yeah, there are those who choose to be jerks. But remember that this life is one big opportunity, isn't it? Our lives are one big opportunity. It's an opportunity for the just. And it's also an opportunity for the unjust. It's an opportunity to choose God. And it's an opportunity for those who are choosing to do evil. And the scripture gives instructions to those who are choosing good, choosing God. Those who want to know their heavenly father. Those who are trying to follow the example of Jesus. And God is happy you're choosing that. He loves that you're choosing that. But you know what? He also loves those other people as well. And so what is he giving them? Opportunity. Though they seem to not be choosing him at this moment, what does he want them to do? And we learn when we read like the writings of Peter, this is the reason why he's not come back already. Is what Peter says. This is the reason why God has not come back already. He's waiting for more people to come to him. He's continuing to give humanity the opportunity. And see, when we hate those, we consider our enemies, what have we done? When we hate those, we consider our enemies, what have we done? We've pretty much decided their fate for them, haven't we? We've pretty much removed their opportunity in our eyes, haven't we? We want, even at times, we long for them to get what? Judgment. We long for them to get judgment for the things they've done and the things they've done to us. And so we refuse to love. We refuse to forgive. We only want to love those that are easy to love. We only want to love those who love us. And that last part that he said there, man, that stresses us out a bit, doesn't it? Because what did he say we have to be? Anybody pick pick it up? Anybody know the word that I'm talking about? Perfect. Man, he just laid down the expectation. And the expectation is perfection. Perfection. Realize that that word means, uh, the word perfect also means mature, right? We think about it as I always have to do the right thing, but the word means mature. The word means complete. And we think about God being that, right? God being perfect, God being mature, God being complete. In this context, how is he that? Well, he knows the whole story, doesn't he? God sees the complete picture when it comes to people. And Jesus commands us to love our enemies because there's something bigger at play here. And sometimes we think that our lives should be like those movies because what happens in the movies is pretty cut and dry, isn't it? A lot of times the good guy does what? And the bad guy does what? Right? That's the way it should be. Right? Let's figure out who the good guys and bad guys are. Good guys win. Bad guys are defeated. Good guys live. Bad guys are killed. Right? And we want want life to be like the movies. But brothers and sisters, as Christians, our job is not to kill all the bad guys. But understand that everyone is someone that God wants to ultimately see come to repentance. And our time here is an opportunity for that. Our time here is an opportunity to come to know Jesus. Everyone has the opportunity. Don't prematurely remove that for somebody. The Apostle Paul echoes the words of Jesus in Romans 12, 9-21, where he writes and he encourages Christians. He says, 
Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. And practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good See, brothers and sisters, this is what a Christian life should look like. We love people, those inside the church, and then we show hospitality to those outside of the church. That means we welcome them. We do not repay evil for evil. We do not seek revenge. We have some modern idioms that tell us that you fight fire with what? That is wrong. We do not give people what's coming to them. Christian people are gracious and merciful. And that is to be offered to everyone. We need to be perfect as God is perfect. That doesn't mean we never mess up or sin. That means we're able to see the complete picture. That means we're mature. And we choose to live at peace with people. Because we want them to have the opportunity. We don't condone evil, right? We're clear about good and evil. We love good. We hate what's evil. But we are to see people as God sees them. Even those who do not know him right now. Even those who are not, who are not living by his standard right now. Because when God looks at those people, what does he see? He sees a valuable soul. When God looks at those people, what does he see? He sees someone who may be broken. He sees someone who is lost and in the darkness. He sees someone who may be wrapped up in bad things right now. Someone who may be acting out right now. And yes, their behavior is wrong, but do not remove their opportunity to repent. God wants us to do what we can to help them make those right choices. So if a person, even if they're our enemy, is hungry, what do we do? And after taking care of those basic needs, we need to still give them that opportunity to repent. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And then after doing the right thing and loving that person by taking care of that basic need, they still hate you. If they still hate you after that, you fed them, you've given them something to drink. And let's say they still hate you after that. 
we don't judge. We don't withhold love. We don't remove the opportunity. But Paul reminds us that God is the judge. And there's coming a day when he will avenge his people and he will repay those who have remained in their evil ways. But God's people don't remove the opportunity for them to change, for them to repent, for them to turn their lives around. So love your enemy. Love your enemy. That means sometimes even it's going to cost us to love our enemy. It's going to cost us to do something that's beneficial for someone who hates us. But we do, we do those things so that they may ultimately benefit eternally. I know this is a hard teaching for us this morning. Because there's so many emotions wrapped up in what someone may have done to us. A history maybe of hurt. But like I said, this lifetime is about opportunity. Do you believe in do you believe people can change? Anybody believe people can change? Did you change? Have you changed? How many Christians are here who've been the jerk? You going to work to not be the jerk anymore? Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer together. And as we pray, uh, stand up. We're going to eventually sing a song, but I want us to pray together. And I want to ask I want to ask God to forgive us. Even those of you who are, man, you're, you're giving it a go and you're trying to live a Christian life and you're trying to be who God wants you to be. We still need forgiveness along the way, along that walk. And then help us to be forgiving to those people who, man, we might have a grudge against. Help us to be forgiving and pray for those people that might have a grudge against us and be treating us unfairly, that God brings them around to repentance. Let's pray together. Father God, we talked a little bit about opportunity and we're just so grateful for the opportunity we have right now to be here, to be gathered together, to be in a room with people that, uh, that love you, that believe in you, that are trying to live our, their lives to, to please you and to serve you and to be a good witness to, of your love to, to family and friends and co-workers and, and, and people that we, we meet and interact with. And, and, um, I pray today as an encouragement for us to realize that, man, the love of God is supposed to radiate out from us. And we're supposed to love even those people who not only don't love us, we're supposed to even love those people that hate us and are against us and are opposed to us. And in doing so, I pray that we show the example of Jesus to them and that that will have an impact on their lives. And that will help them to understand that you've loved not only us, you've loved them as well. And you came and you died and you rose again so that their sins could be forgiven and so that they could have the indwelling of the Spirit and so that they can ultimately be with you in your glory. And we read that verse that said, you know, you are the judge and and by us being kind, it may result in that that's heaping burning coals on their head, meaning that God sees how they've treated us in those instances and how they didn't accept that love and that grace. And in doing so, they're compounding judgment upon themselves. But we pray that that doesn't happen. And we pray that people come around and repent and accept you and accept your forgiveness and your love. And so I pray for us today, those who are Christians in the room today, 
that we learn to love that way. We learn to love everyone. We learn to love people who are different from us. We learn to love people who are of different races and different nationalities and of different um, socioeconomic uh, categories and, and that we don't see any of that. I pray we don't see any of that. We just love. I pray we even love those who want nothing to do with us, want nothing to do with you, and actually hate us. And just help us to be a witness. I pray you be with anyone this morning who's considering making a decision for you that they choose today to do that. They choose today to accept your love and your forgiveness and your spirit so we can have more people here that are going out and sharing and showing that love. All these things we come to you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.